Welcome back. So second half of the week, this is that first aileron uh, now bonded together as you saw last time. And it's not quite mass balanced yet, so we're probably going to be putting a, a combination spade and extra weight on there. Um, the spade will help with uh, minimizing you know, the stick forces and the extra weight will um, you know, get the mass balance correct so we don't have any chance of flutter with it at uh, any sort of um, flying speeds. So you'll see more of that later on. And back on the door lock, so now I'm getting the hooks in place here with the actuators now that they're all completed. And as you can see, um, you can just move the actuators now and the hooks uh, engage and disengage. And the over center mechanism is working nicely in there. So when they're fully engaged like that, you see there's no way to pull that back out. So I can't accidentally sort of come undone. So the linkages are next. And then also to here, you see the pin locks are in place they don't have an over center um, there is an over center mechanism that's going to operate the whole thing as well which will stop it from accidentally uh, coming unlocked and Zach and Keith have been spending quite a lot of time in the fuselage here they're in the process of bonding in um, the little backing plates there for those uh, doors for the pressurization um, for the bulkhead there and as you can see this is looking in from the back there you can just see that there's that plate there that has all the nut plates on it they're just bonding that into place with some high sole now so when all the bolts go through there to hold the doors on they have something to bite into with the thread and also we're um, in the process of, of uh, putting these um, compression sleeves in for where the seat belt mounts are in the back pressure wall and I uh, didn't have time to run up to Brits for the lathe for this one so I just got the step drill out and we're just drilling this FR4 out um, just initially with a step drill and then back with a 7 16 here. So um, actually it turns out for certain things you don't actually need a lathe. Um, so I was able to get um, those drilled out. There were six of those. And that was I think the 7 eighths of an inch diameter FR4 with now a 7 16 um, inch hole in there. So that all worked out. And when the guys are done, they put a whole bunch of clamps on there as well, just to hold uh, hold that in place. So as you can see, um, it's all looking good. So and there's those ones there, just sort of sit in place there for where the seat belts are. So there's ones for the uh, rear seat belts and also for the uh, inertial reel um, holders there for the front seats. And this is that one in the nose compartment there. This is um, a hard point for where these little manifolds. Um, for the gear retraction system is going to be but you'll see more on that later and here this is those ones we uh, bonded into place just the ends for where the rudder cables are in the uh, strakes and just moving really quickly here so this is a little mounting plate uh, Jim made that up with a couple of nut plates on it that'll be bonded in place for inside the aileron and that's for the little trim motor a little mounting place for with it the actual trim motor for it because we're going to have aileron trim in there to keep the aircraft balanced in roll and there's Zach back in the fuselage, so this time now he is, is actually bonding in those um, the seat belt hard points there, or compression sleeves. So the double one there is for where the rear seat um, brackets are, and then the single one is for the inertial reel. And you'll see that um, the completed thing in a minute. And by the end of day Friday, we had um, some of these um, pin locks hooked up to the actuating rods. So they're just running independent right now, but they will be hooked up to the quadrant eventually. Um, but you can see four of them working uh, sort of in unison there and I still need a little bit of tuning on there it's just there's a little bit of a hang up in some of the places there but we'll get that all dialed in so it's just silky smooth and then uh, the bottom side there with the hooks that's actually hooked up to the quadrant so um, you can actually just move the quadrant a little bit there and it activates all those hooks and that one's actually m working fairly smoothly so we still got the to hook up the pins to the quadrant and then also there's uh, three other pins on the other side of the door so as you you can see that you know there's a lot of finicky you know work and stuff with getting this system to work and that's why we're going to change it up for something simpler for production but anyway more to come on that uh, next week and after everyone left on Friday I fired up the engine so this time the goal was to run it for half an hour and at this at a set rpm which I actually chose 2700 and I wanted to compare exactly how much fuel it burnt uh, compared to what the ECU was saying. So uh, here's the engine warming up and I'll let you have a bit of a listen to it uh, as I bring it up to um, a, just a quick power under 3300 RPM and then bring it back to the 27.
Okay, so right at that point, I had set it to 2700 RPM, and uh, basically what I did right then is I went and dipped the tank. And you'll see the results of that here shortly. And then right after dipping the tank, I started my stopwatch and let it run for 30 minutes, at which point I dipped the tank again. So anyway, while that's happening and that was running, um, I thought I'd show you a couple other things. So these are the antennas we're going to use for COM. I uh, decided not to use those uh, ones for composite aircraft because I, f I just felt that um, we were going to end up with a block signal. So there's a transponder antenna there that's just going to hang below the fuselage where the gear is and then the, the two whip antennas for um, communications, COM radios again hang, hang below as well and then this one is the nav one that's actually going to be embedded in the foreplane um, so because that one just has to work you know for VORs and it down looking is fine you know and uh, here's the results of what uh, Zach and Keith did so they got those uh, ones bonded in you can see they also bolted the brackets on there for the rear ones uh, the rear seat belt mounts so uh, those are done and actually just looking from the uh, back side of the bulkhead this is what it looks like so there's a backing plate as well that I did a while ago so those don't pull through at all and the other ones are just in shear so they'll just get a big washer and uh, here's the, the uh, more work that Jeff's been doing on the uh, aileron trim tab so he's kind of cut out there and made sort of a, a wall around there um, for it to sit in and that's that's the top skin of it and then that mold that we've been working on this guy here that's to create the bottom skin so it has a little bit of curvature at, and on the front end so that one's pretty much ready to go now so Jeff will be laying up that little um, you know a few plies there for that aileron trim tab next week and he also got um, some other molds prepped in that so these are sprayed with primer so these are the ones for the elevator and there's uh, two of these for the lower skins of the ele elevators and uh, so there's one and there's the other one and then there's also um, the one next to it for uh, the upper skins so those just need to have the material cut in the core done and then they can be laid up not really uh, that complicated at least laying them up there's going to be more work to do with the hinges and all that stuff later on but you'll see that in a future episode and back on the engine here about 25 minutes in and um, for anyone who had concerns before that um, door there is actually four feet in the air that's our loading dock so no one can accidentally walk in that door I and mean, they could accidentally walk out that door but I was the only one in the shop when this is running and I'm keeping an eye on things and uh, so you know don't worry about us not having a cage around there I've got it covered and I need to be able to sort of look around the side there to see how things are going with the engine and having a cage around there is just going to make life more difficult for me I'm very careful so don't worry too much about that but anyway engine's running great um, not having any problems with it and uh, you'll see in a minute the results of this uh, test run and uh, maybe you'll be as surprised as I was and um, in between um, all of us we can maybe figure out exactly uh, what's going on here because it's a bit of a mystery um, right now but you'll see that in a minute And here we are pretty much at the end of the run. I'm sorry for the bad focus. Um, my camera just doesn't like to focus when it's looking at a reflective screen like that. It's trying to focus on me in the reflection, I guess. Uh, anyway, so the engine was running nicely there, 220 degrees on the oil temp, which is not bad, um, considering the cooling setup that I have. And uh, ran it for the half an hour, as I said. And uh, here are the results. So please excuse the format, I just emailed this to myself from my phone. So here's what happened. Um, I dipped the tank initially at um, 4 and 32, uh, sorry, 30, 30 seconds inches deep for fuel. I put 4.05 gallons in exactly and uh, dipped it again. It was 6 and 28, uh, 30 seconds. So some simple math there, basically 1 and 30, 30 seconds is uh, equal to 4.05 gallons, and uh, 1 inches actually. And so one gallon is equal to 0.478 inches, and that's about right because it's a 10 inch uh, tall tank and it contains 20 gallons. So I uh, ran the engine at 2700 RPM uh, there, and the total time from dipping the tank the first time when I got it to 2700 to the second was uh, 29 uh, minutes and 46 seconds. So when I first dipped it, it was 6.75 inches deep, the fuel. 
and after the 29 minutes it was 5 and 28 30 seconds deep so that turns out to be uh, 0 0.875 inches of fuel used divide that by 0 0.478 um, basically tells me it was 1.83 gallons uh, used during that 29 minutes and uh, multiply that by 60 divide it by 29 and 3 quarters or 29.75 and so that's telling me 3.89 gallons an hour, which is just crazy because the ECU is telling us it's um, burning 6.5 gallons an hour. So something is amiss somewhere. Hopefully somebody can help um, figure out for me uh, what I've done wrong or what's going on. But it just seems crazy low. It's absolutely, there's no you know magical fuel getting deposited back in the tank from somewhere. That's all it used. So going over to my uh, spreadsheet from a while ago, if I put those numbers back in there, so the RPM 2700 put in, it was only 9 pounds of boost running there, 9.4, put in the temps there for um, out, out of the second turbo and then the temp coming out of the, um, and pressure and temp coming out of the intercooler. Um, you know, this spreadsheet calculates, you know, ha the, all the flows, how much airflow there is and knowing the air fuel ratio, it, it can figure out what gallons per hour it is. So this is basically saying 8.1 gallons an hour is what the fuel burn should be there and with the specific fuel consumption of um, 0.326 that's saying 174 horsepower. So um, this is miles off compared to what the engine actually used. So somewhere something is wrong either we're only generating half the horsepower of um, what I'm thinking or this thing is just magically not burning any fuel. Uh, anyway, um, hopefully we can figure it all out, but uh, other than that, um, it's definitely moving some air, as you can see the trees and stuff moving, but if you have any comments on uh, what you think's going on, I'd uh, love to hear it, and uh, maybe we can figure it out. So anyway, that's our update for this week, and um, we'll have some more engine stuff next week. So thanks again for watching.